Good evening. Welcome to Tuesday night. Tuesday night. When I'm not in school, I don't realize what day it is. It'll do that to you. Uh, if you're a visitor, you're our honored guest, and if you would, take a moment to fill out uh, the visitor's card located in the back of the pew in front of you so we can have a record of your attendance again. We'd greatly appreciate that. Uh, also, we'll let everybody come in and kind of settle down. Mike is back with us this evening. Um, so he's here again, and they've got the slides figured out, so I'll let them go over that. Um, I did have one announcement that I failed to mention, and she's not here tonight, but uh, Abigail Lofton, her team won third overall in the World Series of Softball this last weekend. So when you see her, congratulate her on that, um, on that success. Uh, are there any other announcements at this point? Right. Well, if you would, we'll begin with a word of prayer. We bow. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, and we thank you again for this opportunity we have to come together this evening to hear another lesson regarding the flood that, through which mankind had a, had a rebirth in a sense, and the flood that symbolizes the baptism and the washing away of, of our own sins. And we pray that as Mike has prepared a lesson, he has a ready recollection of those things, and that we listen attentively, and we take a portion of that and, and study it ourselves and apply it as we, as we can. Father, there are many among us who are in need of your care, many among us who know of others who are sick, or whatever the case may be, and we ask that you, you look after those people as, as you see fit, Father, and in all things, your will be done. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Back with you, some of you told Coach Spann ahead of time that you knew he was going to make a sarcastic comment about me. You're supposed to wait till he does that. Do I have to explain this? So, uh, but he did a good job, didn't he? Um, I thought he was going to tell a story. He, uh, when I was at Lipscomb, he died on our court at halftime of his game. Our girls were playing their girls in the region, and he had a heart attack and passed away. Did he mention that at all? Uh, yeah. I t he's got a, a talk on that, and y'all need to have him out to do that sometime because it's it's unbelievable uh and you know when we talk about rivalries and you know uh when you know tennessee and alabama and bandy and uh you know want to win and all that and that's fine i'm into that stuff also but what saved him there just so happened to be six medical people that night three from good pasture and three from lipscomb that came to him and brought him back to life on our court and uh, it was kind of neat to see that. Uh, they had never worked together before, but they brought him back together. In fact, one of the nurses who works in, in a, a trauma unit said they, had, they worked together better than any group she's ever been with that she's trained with. She says, unbelievable. So uh, uh, you really need to have him out sometime. Okay, Eric, really, you've covered a lot of the material that we could almost just let the puppet skits, you know, suffice for some of this. Hopefully we've got this coordinated a little bit, I hope. Uh, just a real quick brief review, don't have time to do much, but I, I want to go through this real fast. Uh, it's been 1,656 years since the flood. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and uh, every intention of his heart was uh, only on evil continually. Uh, God said, I'm going to have to blot out man. Now, question for thought, is God cruel for doing this? Is God cruel for drowning Little puppies and ponies and babies and nice people. One thing we need to keep in mind is God expects us to keep His laws perfect because He's perfect. Once you look at this scripture in James chapter 2, verse 10, whoever, that would include most of us in this room, obeys the whole law but sins in one area, one time. Now let's, let's think about that for a second. Pick out a sin, and don't pick out one of the, quote, big ones. Now, you know what I mean by that. There's not really big and little sins, but, you know, there's a little difference in, you know, stealing a pencil in the fifth grade versus leaving a bomb at the Boston Marathon. There's a little difference. Now, they're both sin, but there's a little difference socially and traumatically. But pick out, pick out a sin. You took a dollar out of your mom's purse when you weren't supposed to. You cheated a little bit on your income tax. You told a white lie. You, you live perfectly, but you sin that one time. You commit that one little sin. 
You disobey your parents once. You say a slang word one time. You sin in one area, it says you're guilty of breaking all of it. Boom. Here's why. Because God is perfect, all sin offends Him. God is not just good, He's perfect. It's kind of like saying, God is not smart, He's all knowledge. Do we have any kids, uh, or have we had any kids here? 4.0. Yeah, some of you, they don't want to brag. Any, any former 4.0 people in here? Don't you, don't you just hate people like that? <laughs> I don't, I'm a Christian, but some of you may. Uh, some of you may. <laughs> Yeah, some of them nodded and went like that, but I don't. It's sad. Okay. Um, let's suppose that uh, God lets one sin into heaven. Then he's not perfect. Because God is perfect, all sin offends him. He cannot have any sins in heaven. And he must punish sin. Let me illustrate that. Let's go back to the courtroom situation. And someone has murdered someone that you love. And you're sitting there waiting for the sentencing. It's already been determined that he's guilty, and now they're going to come out with the sentencing. And you're sitting there going, man, I don't know what I want. I don't know if I want life in prison or the electric chair. Life, electric chair. You're even thinking life in the electric chair. That's what you'd like. And the, the judge comes in and looks at the defendant and says, son, would you please rise? The young man stands up and says, yes, father. The judge is his daddy. And the judge says, Now, son, look, you can't be going around killing people. Now, we're going to let it go this time. But if you ever kill anybody again, we're going to have to take some car keys away. Do you understand me, young man? Yeah, my fault, Dad. I'm sorry, my bad. All right, now you're a good boy, but you've got to stop that killing. All right? Now, get on home. Mom's got dinner ready. Okay, Dad, thanks. Hey, see you. My bad. I'm sorry. And as he walks out the courtroom, he looks at you and says, Gotcha. Let me ask you this. Are you going to let that go? You're going to let that go? There's going to be another murder, isn't there? You multiply that feeling you would have if that happened by a million, by a billion, by a trillion. That's how God feels when I steal a pencil from a kid in the fifth grade. When I say a cuss word one time. When I get high or drunk once. When I have to have sex with my girlfriend on the weekend. That's how God feels when we commit one sin. Because he's totally perfect. And that sin has to be punished. It has to be dealt with. He can't let it slide. He's perfect. So he decides to do that to his son. He literally is pounding and kicking and pouncing on his own son. Now here's a great scripture. This is a scripture really we all need to know by heart. It's not one that, that's usually in those memory lists. But if there was only one verse I could use to teach people the gospel, this would be it, I believe. God made him, and that him there uh, is referring to Christ. God made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become the perfection of God in him. You know, almost everybody knows that when Christ dies for our sins, our sins go to the cross. But something else very important has to happen. His perfection goes to us. To get to heaven, you must be perfect. Remember James 2.10? Whoever keeps the whole law, offends one point, is guilty of all. You have to be perfect. You know, people say, well, nobody's perfect. Right. And that's the problem. You're not. And you cannot get to heaven based on your own accomplishments. And I kind of want to reiterate what I said the other night. And, and again, I don't, I don't know this audience totally. So if you're this person, don't take it personally. There may not be anyone here like this, but just about every congregation I've ever worked with and just about every congregation I've ever spoken at, and again, I haven't, nobody, this isn't a setup. Nobody told me this, okay? But there's almost always an adult that's been going to church for 20 or 30 or 40 years that hasn't become a Christian. And you, I love you, but you need to understand this. Young people, if you don't plan on becoming a Christian one day, you're saying to God, I don't need your son's forgiveness. Thank you. I'm just fine. I can appear before God just like I am. That's what you're saying. That's what you're saying. Heard about a funeral where a guy that was a real good, great American neighbor and all that, but he wasn't a Christian. But he was a great person. Good guy. 
he dies and at the, at the funeral, one of his friends got up and says, uh, only a fool would keep Bill out of heaven and God ain't no fool. Whoa. That's painting God into a corner, isn't it? No, God's not a fool. He's perfection. He can't let Bill into heaven if Bill is not forgiven by the blood of Christ. The flood actually demonstrates God's hatred for sin. Why don't you think about this? I think the, the flood story is one of the most gracious, merciful acts God could have ever done. Think about this. How many saved people at the time? Take your time. Eight. Good, good. If you haven't heard the story. Eric, we may need to cover that some more tomorrow night, okay? Eight. Well, another generation, and there might not have been anybody good left. I mean, this planet right now, if he, he hadn't sent the flood, it might just be just crawling even worse than it is with evil. I believe it was one of the most gracious things he could have ever done. So no, this was not mean what God did. There was one bright shining spot. Let's get back to our story here. There was one bright shining spot. We talked about Noah. And young people, I hope you'll be that in your school. Uh, Noah found favor in God's sight. And he said, I suggest you build an ark of gopher wood. We talked about that. Could possibly be laminated wood, like the gophering aspect of a skirt. And let's run through that real quickly. If it was Egyptian, uh, since he came from Egypt, uh, these would have been the dimensions. And uh, let's fly on through that. I, I, I did want to say this uh, about the ark. Uh, at this position, it could have been hit by the 6 to 1 ratio. It could have got hit with a tidal wave and literally gotten into this position and not capsized. Where if you're two to one ratio, you got your robot, it's over. But the six to one is perfect balance uh, for the art. Uh, he had probably a hundred years or so, we think, possibly to build it. We talked about that. He didn't take just seven on there, but a pair of sevens, and there were actually fourteen and four, not seven and two, as we've uh, kind of always grown up hearing about. But Eric, go ahead though and do the song tomorrow. Don't throw everything off, you know. Like they came by 14s and 4s, that's really going to throw the children off. So stick with the song. Uh, just tell them that's the, that's the NIV version or something of it. Okay. A little humor there. Uh, there's only one way into the ark. Jesus is that way. And we mentioned uh, Noah made sure his family got to heaven. He got them up for church every Sunday. Had them there. Uh, those that entered went in, male and female, from every kind of living being as God ordered them. And Adonai, uh, or the Lord, shut him inside. And when God shuts the door on this world for the last time, be sure you're on the right side of that door. Kids, uh, time is running out. It's winding down. Are you ready? I, I don't know when that's going to be. I've been hearing preachers talk about this since I was a little bit of kid. One day, will you at least expect it could happen? I'm 56, it hadn't happened yet. But it may happen before we get home tonight. Isn't that an intimidating thought? You've got plans for this week. I'm going to a basketball camp in the morning. Or I may be standing before the throne of God. By the way, if uh, the Lord does return, they're going to cancel the camp. There's that understanding. They will cancel. Any plans you've made will be canceled. But that's how close we are, y'all. That's why we're supposed to be ready and not supposed to say, well, I'll get baptized when I get older. Did you know there was a, a heresy in the church way back in the, like the 3rd and 4th century? And again, I'm not down on these people because every church generation has its heresies. By the way, we've had them too. Okay? We, we've had them too. Where we haven't always taught everything exactly the way we should. But there was the belief that you get baptized at the end of your life to make sure all your sins are forgiven. Because if you get baptized and then you keep living, then those sins are going to count against you. That, that's how they understood it. And people would wait till their deathbed. The only problem with that is, what if you don't live old? What if you don't make it home? And that's why it's so important that we're ready. Well, the, uh, the thing is not working. It will in a moment, though. You have until 8.05. Okay. They told me that. I have until 8.05. That Y'all didn't see that, though, but I do. I have until 8.05. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Hurry up and shut up and sit down. <laughs> so wonderful. Uh, <laughs> I've never had that. I've, I have a tough time recovering from that one. All right, thank God on the ark. I'm just a puppet down here is all I am. Uh, they got on the ark and uh, had seven days to prepare to get ready. And I bet that was a long week in a lot of ways. Because remember, the, the boys had not talked to Noah. Uh, excuse me, to God. Only Noah had. So <laughs> it might have been that, I wonder if he really did hear it right, y'all. And just waiting and waiting and waiting. Furthermore, you also have to remember there had never been rain for 1,656 years. You had perfect weather. This was basically what the weather forecast was all the time. If you have a planet that's never had rain, and the, the scripture, I should have put it up there, it's Genesis 2, 5, and 6. If you have a planet with no rain, that means you have a beautiful uniform temperature with the water bubbling up from underneath. The old King James says a mist used to rise up. We picture, you know, at Kroger's, with the, they're sprinkling the water on the flowers out front. That's not what the Hebrew word means. There was underground springs bubbling up on the surface and creating a, kind of like in the Nile Delta. That was coming up all the time. So you would have had beautiful weather all of the time, every day. It was like this, constantly everywhere. And so when the weatherman gets up and says, you know, we've had 75, 80 degrees for 656 years. I don't know what this report about bad weather is, but it was coming. It was coming on the horizon. And uh, after seven days, the flood came down. It was not like this, y'all. Eric alluded to it in the puppet show about it. It wasn't just water coming down. We're told very vividly how it happens. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, that all the fountains of the great deep burst open. Now you've got that coinciding with and the windows of the heavens were opened. Okay? So what we've got here is the water coming down from above. And I hope that's flipping here. Coming down like a waterfall. That's what I like to picture it coming down like. If you've been down to Destin, the big Cahoon, you know, had the falls come down. You get, oh, that feels so good on my shoulder. It wasn't that. It wasn't that. It was coming down. Umbrellas would not have helped that day when this happened. Now some of you old people like me, remember BJ saying, raindrops keep falling on my head? No, it was more like Percy Priest is coming through my roof. <laughs> Lake Erie's crashing through my face. That's more like what it was. We have always pictured people wading down to the ark and scraping on the side of it. That may have happened. I don't think there was time. When you see what happens when the fountains of the great deep burst open, there would have been no opportunity to go, well, we better swim on over there and see if he'll let us in. There wasn't that opportunity. The earth literally rips open. Okay? It explodes with volcanoes. It's just ripping to shreds. Here when it says the fountains of the great deep burst open, it wasn't like that. This has been systematically studied. There's a guy that worked for, uh, uh, worked up at the Pentagon, and he's a very fundamentalist Christian, and he is uh, an expert in geology, and they've studied this. They've taken the Bible and the way the earth looks and this story, and, and here's what they believe happened. That God ripped a seam in the earth that traveled around the earth and got around all the way around in about a couple of hours. And this ripped open at his timing from pressure of water that was just pulsating underneath us for 1,656 years. There's huge water reservoirs all underneath us. And this tiny split in the earth opens up in cracks and geysers start coming out. The mid... Atlantic Ridge, which has buckled like the seam on a baseball, is evidence of the fountains of the great deep burst open. A lot of Christian geologists that are very fundamental, that believe the literal story of the Bible, believe that you're looking at where the fountains of the great deep burst open, that the earth, like an eggshell, is just burst and popped. When that happened, water is going to jet out of that and start creating major landslides as it pushes the land to the side. I think this is a great picture of what it might have looked like. 
Wouldn't it have been rough standing right there? So see, it wasn't, oh, I feel some rain. I better get on down the ark. It was more like, I feel, it's over. <laughs> it's over. There's no time. The earth would have had incredible volcanic activity as it's basically exploding from underneath. It's just incredible to, to, to think about that. This, this seam in the earth gets wider and wider till the top plates slide off at 45 miles per hour, and they meet resistance. Now, I want you to think about right now. If the land we're on right now, this earth that the building's sitting on, if it took off at 45 miles per hour, what's going to happen? We're not going to be surfing and, oh, whoa, going down the highway. It's going to flatten immediately. That's what's happening all over the earth. There wasn't time. Let me swim on down there and see if no one will let us in there. Now, there may have had that opportunity. I don't think we, we pictured, you know, people climbing up in the mountains to avoid the water. You're going to see some evidence in a second. Wasn't any time for that. There's no time for that. There's another shot of that mid-oceanic ridge. As these top plates slide off, when they meet resistance and hit each other, some buckle up and they form our mountain ranges. Some buckle down and they form uh, ocean basins and lake basins. Look at that. Doesn't that look like God just took the earth and like an accordion squeezed it together? As this is happening, you've got major mudslides immediately bearing people and animals and fish. People always ask me about the fish. Did they have an aquarium on the ark? No, they didn't. The Bible says the animals that breathed air got on the ark. So the aquatic animals stayed in the water but a lot of them didn't make it, and we've got mass fossils of them that I'll show you here in a second. This would be a rough day in your neighborhood. That's nothing compared to Noah's day. Now that shuts us down. But this is nothing compared to Noah's day. That's nothing right there compared to Noah's day. More than likely, they were not doing this right here. It would have looked more like that. There would not have been time to form chain lines to, to help rescue people. That would have been impossible right there. Remember when our flood hit a few years ago, a lot of devastation. Was, was anybody up here flooded out? Any of y'all lose anything? Anybody up here a little high ground? You know, uh, we used to live out in Bellevue, and a lot of Bellevue was underneath water. Uh, here's a, a lot of the area downtown. But in Noah's day, it would not even have looked like this. It would have looked more like this coming in. Total devastation. It wouldn't have been going slowly up, Lady Liberty. It would have been knocking her over. These are just some, some slides to show what it might have been like modern day. It was total devastation. Uh, I've even read where some have said... Uh, the pyramids survived the flood. That is ludicrous. The pyramids would have been melted down like anthills being hit by the surf. The pyramids were built after the flood, well after the flood. You had major catastrophe weather problem situations. Leland would have been going nuts. We got a little problem developing over here. It's coming in. So, you know, don't sweat the cold front we mentioned yesterday. It's going to be pretty rough. And the ark is being devastated and hammered. Uh, this is one of my favorite pics I've ever found. Uh, the ark is going through a difficult time, but there's the Lord, or the angel of the Lord, protecting it. And let's make a little life application here. Life is going to be rough, but secure in Christ. They weren't in a protected situation as far as just everything nice and wonderful. It, they probably got seasick. It was a rough ride, but they were okay. In the same way, kids, when we get baptized, you don't get a protective bubble that goes around you and you just get to cruise through life like you're living in Mayberry. Uh, Joel Osteen, one of these TV evangelists, you know, I understand he's a really good person. And I, I, I can tell I would like him. He, I understand he's not one of these rip-off artists. I've heard real good reports on his character. 
And, and he has some good messages. But what Joel says is, if you'll come to Jesus, you'll get that job you want. You'll, you'll recover from that illness. You'll find the person that, that God's got picked out for you, that perfect spouse. No. Sometimes you come to the Lord and things will get worse. You come to the Lord and take a stand, you may get fired from your job because you won't do something illegal. You're not promised a protective bubble physically. You're promised security in Christ. You're promised forgiveness and that He's going to be with us. But not that He's going to carry us around. We're not promised that. Now even though I don't think they had time to do this right here, it's still a vivid image of the difference in being in heaven and hell, isn't it? Because that's hell out there on that rock. To think if they could have looked at the... I don't think they had time. But if they could have, what that would have been like to think, what if we'd gotten on there? When I was a kid, we always had these evangelistic crusades and the preachers, it was usually just heaven and hell, from Monday through Friday, you know, just hammering you pretty hard. And I used to picture people in hell looking at TV monitors of people in heaven. And thinking, well, that'd make it even worse, wouldn't it? And that's kind of what, what's depicted here. So it's, uh, it's a rough ride, but we can still be secure uh, in Christ. Well, let's move on here. Uh, the flood continues for 40 days. The water keeps going up and up. And uh, as Eric mentioned in our little skit there, it gets about 20 feet or so above the highest mountains. Now, Mount Kilimanjaro is up there at 36,000 feet, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Mount Kilimanjaro was around at the time the flood happened. It could have been created during the flood or from post-traumatic you know, <laughs> trauma and tremors later on. But uh, there's no way to know that either way. Uh, the water increased on the earth 150 days, so uh, we've got five months of the water continuing to go up. When you do the math, they're on the ark about a year and 10 days. Some people say about a year and 20 days. But they were on the ark a little bit over a year. Now think about that one for a second. You know, it wasn't 40 days and 40 nights, and God flushes everything, and they, they come out. Uh, so th this is quite an experience. Um, I went uh, deep sea fishing when I was 15 years old, and got a little bit seasick, but I remember when I got back on land, I had trouble walking for a second. And I got in the shower and closed my eyes, and my brain was still rocking back and forth. And I almost fell down in the shower, which is kind of stupid. All you have to open your eyes, you'll be okay. But my, my brain was still rocking back and forth. I wonder what it's like after seven months, because the ark is going to land in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month. Someone pointed out to me that tomorrow is the seventh day, the 17th. Is that right? Coincidence? Yes, your husband pointed that out. That's very impressive. Um, y'all think about that last night? That's pretty good. Very good. Uh, but after seven months, what was it like when you stopped? Did they get, you know, instead of seasick, earthsick? You know, because they're not moving at all here. Uh, then we go to the tenth month. The tops of the mountains are visible. And then um, as we move on here, at the end of 40 days, now we're into the twelfth month. He opened the window of the ark that he had made or the the skylight or whatever that was, was there a tarpaulin cover over there like a convertible and he peels that back? We don't know. Um, there's a lot of neat lessons we could do with these uh, birds here, but we've got to move on real quickly. He sends out the raven, flies around, can't find anything. Then he sends out the dove. Dove brings it back. And uh, I've just always pictured how excited that place would have been. I pictured, you know, no, I know he didn't do this, but I picture him coming out on the balcony. He's got the, the, the twig behind his back and kind of shakes his head like that. And everybody, all the giraffes and the, everybody like that. And then he goes, just joking. And then that place explodes. And, and the elephants go nuts. And monkeys flying around everywhere, wanting cookies and going nuts there. Um, but uh, I, I know that was an exciting time. He brought back an olive leaf. Uh, teaching, I've, I've taught all, just about all grades from seventh grade up, but had eighth grade one time and I had a quiz and I said, what did the dove bring back? And the kid had written an olive tree. I mean, that's quite a dove, you know, bringing that back and dropping it on Noah there. But uh, it was a leaf there. One of those pre-flood doves were pretty rough. Um, they get off the ark and uh, immediately there is a worship service. He takes some of the clean animals and offers them. And we need to keep in mind, that's, what our, that's one aspect of our worship not just when we're corporately together on Sunday 
in Wednesdays and, and this week, but just in our car, just don't bow and close your eyes, kids, when you're driving, but, but to constantly thank God for what He's done for us. There are flood legends all over the place. Uh, there's over 200 around the world. I know this is kind of a busy chart, but look right here. This, the green represents that these civilizations have that part of the story coincide in their culture perfectly with the biblical story. And look at that. Okay, now not all of them have every single part of it. The red represents partial representation. Why are there differences? Remember the game you played uh, in school telephone where the teacher would whisper to this kid uh, a message and by the time it got around to the end, it was distorted in some way. I believe we had the original flood story from the Bible and then as people spread out and get paganized, the, the legends creep in. But what's of significance is there are flood Legends everywhere, all over the world. Here's something else about the Chinese legend, uh, the Chinese language rather. And there's a lot of neat things about the Chinese language in Genesis. If you take the Chinese word for boat and break it apart, look what it forms. Or wh look what forms it. Vessel aid in people. The word for ark in Chinese. You break its characters apart, rectangle and boat. You take the word in Chinese for ship or vessel, Break it apart, ship, eight, and people. Hmm, what a coincidence. Now, you can't take that and prove that to your non-Christian friend. See, that proves the story's true. But it is circumstantial evidence I would, I would offer in court if I was a lawyer for this story. I would say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, why would the Chinese people, thousands of years ago when they were putting their language together, why would they have chosen these words for ship and ark and boat why would they have chosen characters, I'm talking about letters, characters that are the same as the Noah story? Hmm, why do they do that? Again, you can't use that to prove it. You can just use it as circumstantial evidence. Um, Eric, you stole a great line here. This was great. That was the flood global or local. Look how God keeps repeating his point to these people. I've determined to make an end of all flesh. I'll bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. See, there are a lot of liberal scholars that believe the Bible. They think it, it's, the story is true, but they don't believe it was global. They believe it was just a local flood that flooded that area. Look how God keeps repeating himself. And all flesh died, all swarming creatures, all mankind, everything on the earth. Dry land, which had uh, the breath of life. He blotted out everything. They were blotted out. Only Noah. He just keeps going. I feel like he's talking to my 8th grade class sometimes here. Just keeps repeating the same thing over and over. I will never again strike down every living creature as I have done. Plus the question is, if the flood was local and not global, why gather the animals? Why do that? Why not just move? Why go to all that trouble? Let's just move over here, y'all. Why go to that trouble? How could the flood... And here's, here's, here's what Eric said in the puppet skit that was so true. How could the flood have been local if the highest mountains were covered by 20 feet? And Eric, I thought you were going to show this picture right here and steal my thunder. Because that's exactly the way it would have had to have been if it covered the highest mountains, but it was only local. Makes no sense at all. Um, let me real quickly introduce this. What... I'm not, I haven't got another warning. Was it 810 or 805? Okay. Uh, to, let, let's stop right there. Uh, and, and tomorrow what I'd like to do is go through some geological evidences of the worldwide flood and show you some incredible pictures that show what has happened on our planet. If you, uh, if you believe the ark story, you would expect on our planet to find millions of dead things laid down in layers by water all over the earth. And you know what we have around the earth? We have millions of dead things laid down by water in layers all over the earth. And I've got some really cool pictures of fossils uh, that are really incredible and some really neat scenes from around our planet that indicate a worldwide flood. And we also want to make sure that we bring in some uh, practical application like we did at the front of this lesson. But I do want to close uh, in talking about uh, the end of the world. 
my wife and I worked at, as you, a lot of you know, at the Laverne Congregation for 10 years, and we were coming up I-24 toward Laverne. I'd taken her out to eat at a real nice restaurant. We'd been at Crystal. And so we're, nothing's too good for my honey. And so we're, we're headed back after I'd had my 12, and uh, we're headed up the interstate and just coming up the same track I did a while ago, and the sun was setting at the end of the, at the end of the highway, and the, the clouds were billowing out, and it looked like just a huge fireball, and it looked exactly like what I had always pictured the end of the world. And I said, kind of as a joke, I said, honey, that looks like the end of the world, doesn't it? And she's just staring back, cause, and also, as we're getting closer, it looks like it's kind of growing, you know? And, and I don't hear anything back from her. And I went, hun? And her eyes are spinning around because for a second, it, is this it? Uh, relax, it wasn't, if any of you were wondering. That was not the end of the world. We continued on, and then some of y'all were born, and you're here today. Um, but that's not the way it's going to be because we're sitting there wondering, is that the end of the world? I'm not sure, honey, is it? And I was, I was looking right into it, waiting to see the figure of the Lord just, you know, coming out of there. When it happens, there'll be no doubt. Uh, it will be instantaneous. And it's going to be too late. And, and I know, I, I grew up in a church culture where we probably overdid the, the hell, the judgment. But your kids, y'all's church culture, I don't mean here, I'm talking about the, 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 the American church culture has gone the other direction and we don't want to talk about judgment and hell and just everything's love and riding Shetland ponies at the circus and Jesus loves you. And yes, we need to emphasize the grace of God. Jesus loves me, this I know. But if I don't become a Christian, to hell I will go. Now, I don't think we ought to do that little song when we bring them back in. Okay? But that is the reality. Jesus does love us. But the consequences of not following Him will be on our shoulders and we're going to have to bear that. In the words of Sandlot, a very deep theological movie, forever. On and on. And that's a real long time. That's a real long time. That's longer than exams. That's longer than working in the sun on these hot summer days. That's longer than a bad date. Forever is a long, long time. And we want to make sure you're in the right spot.